Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Votes Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. As you can see on the screen, as you see it right now, you, you'll see the, the forum, if you will, or the, the, the promotional forum of the Dr. King's Day. I want to, and the reason why we're doing it this way is that it's very, very important that we, we are, we are, at the end of the day, people are looking at what have we accomplished at the end of the day. There, there are many events talking about Dr. King, but in all due respect, my folks, uh, <laughs> I want to focus on the ones that I, that I feel that will really give back to community. And that's what we're going to be doing. We've been doing, I think, over the last three, three years, we've been doing it that way. So you've got, the, you've got it on the screen. And as you know, it says right up front, it says the 31st anniversary, Victory Beyond the Dream. That's the theme. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., tribute. We work to keep alive the dream. Well, what we're going to do this time around, I'm going to introduce you some of the main players, if you will, in, the, in this whole event aspect of it, beautiful event for the community. And then from that point on, I might ask them a question, but I want to introduce uh, Mr. Grice, Mr. Donnie Dare over here. I think he's the president, you're the president? Yes, sir. And Chappie Grice, and I knew his dad, and his day, and he's probably looking up there right now, he's checking us out, Donnie. <laughs> yeah, he's on okay. the <laughs> Okay, good. Well, look here, what we're gonna do, we're gonna get a good definition of uh, the World Arts Foundation. We've been doing this for the last, how many years? 31. 31 years. 31? 31st anniversary. Yep. I must be getting young in my age. <laughs> you are. <laughs> okay, good. What we're going to do, we're going to get the we're going to get the full scoop of and the scope of uh, and they're sort of like where they're going, how they how they how they generate it, the whole nine yard, and then from that point I'll ask one question and we'll go from there. Okay? Good. All right. Well, Maybe. I can start by saying that um, first of all, it's an honor to be uh, able to serve the community in this way, and I thank you for opening your show that we might share uh, uh, some some of the intricacies uh, as a way of people uh, realizing there's a lot that goes into it and that we do have a vision and that's why we've transitioned the title from um, Keep Alive the Dream to Victory Beyond the Dream oh, as right people yeah. looking ahead and victory is going to require action and uh, an organized action at that so we'll get our young people to be thinking in the same way that our team mm -hmm. has been thinking over the past 30 years. It hasn't been easy but uh, it sure is a, a witness of what uh, yes. small uh, ethnic community organization can do and um, so why'd you do it why'd you guys get involved in um, and how'd you go about doing well uh, Ken Barry who is the architect of the of the program in particular uh, was we started out really as a talent show to showcase the talent that was in the community that many people didn't know about and we used the Martin Luther King um, birthday before it became a national holiday mm. uh, we were putting these uh, kind of events together and then it just evolved year after year the expectation in the community rose mm -hmm. and uh, it is uh, just a, a blessing that World Arts Foundation Incorporated a nonprofit corporation in the state mm -hmm. of Oregon mm -hmm. um, has been able to stay in the black and been able to meet its goals which by some measures are modest mm -hmm. but on the other hand are um, uh, laudable in the sense of operating on the economy of scale. Right, we're touching right. hundreds of kids each year, we're touching hundreds of families, um, and it would be incomplete to uh, I'm transition to Donnie Adair and, and executive producer uh, Ken Berry, but uh, right at the beginning of this has been KBOO Radio. Yeah, yeah. And KBOO right. is a solid partner with World Arts Foundation Inc. and the program, the seven hour long tribute to Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr on Monday the 18th, it's a day on, not a day off, will be simulcast and broadcast streamed worldwide. So we're emphasizing that, that to get in touch with your friends and relatives across the nation and across the world and let them tune in. And of course, we're inviting people and to PCM. come down. And PCM. Well, okay, they'll be very well, much okay, involved. Media is going to be right. uh, one of our sources for the visual. Right. And uh, KBU Radio, our longstanding partner, is going to take care of streaming it worldwide. Donnie Adair, I was asking you to to give a perspective from the MC's uh, podium there, that you've been there how many years? How many years, Donnie? This will be my what 30 you know from that first vantage point. 30 first year. Year, and uh, really blessed. First of all, Bruce, thank you for having us on your hey, show. thank you all. And uh, we look forward to the Marine Color Guard that's going to be on the program that you've arranged for us Appreciate this that. year Buffalo to help us yes, in our opening ceremonies. And we know that it's going to help us focus and, and get off to a good day and to honor all of the veterans 
Very and, much so. And others who've served and, and, and done the things to support Martin Luther King's values, and his dreams that he's shared with us. I've been the MC uh, since we first began. and um, You started by yourself. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I don't do a seven-hour program by myself anymore. I used to fall out, you know. The three musketeers. Yeah, I could go to work the next Portland day and, and that kind of stuff. But uh, I've, I've enjoyed it, and, and I've enjoyed the opportunity to share with a number of people over the years the opportunity to introduce our uh, young people's groups and schools and, and the distinguished uh, speakers, uh, official representatives of government and, and our clergy and other yeah, right. members of the community that come out and speak and give us encouragement to keep uh, uh, and actually have a victory beyond this dream that Martin Luther King gave us of equality, freedom, and peace in our country and in the world. So it's particularly important at this time that we yes. continue to talk about those things as mm -hmm. terrorism and other things uh, rear their ugly heads throughout mm -hmm. the world yes. and in our own country. Yes. We need to be vigilant. We need to be energetic. We need to be active about letting people know that love mm -hmm. is it, it, mm -hmm. it does conquer mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. and, and that that is the only true way to get peace and freedom yes. we don't have enough guns to go out and fight and overcome uh, you've got to change people's hearts and their minds as well and that's what this program mm -hmm. teaches young people who participate in it we've got uh, a great relationship with Portland Public Schools as we talked about before the start of the show, we were following some of their policy issues that might have affected us, and we're happy to say that our relationship remains the same with Portland Public Schools, and we have a number of the schools participating again yes, this yes, year. Yes. And I'll talk about those a little bit more after Ken Berry talks about, and I'll talk about some of the specific okay. schools that are participating with okay. us. But I'm just happy to be back as the MC. These guys are my bosses. They asked me to do it <laughs> what 31 years have. ago, and <laughs> so they keep asking me back, and that's an honor, and that's a privilege. Well, in all due respect, a Portland community medium appreciates the fact and the fact that you've actually been a part of our, we're part of the family, too, with you of guys. Course, course. And I'm reminded of Larry Dunham. Of course. Mm -hmm. Yes. Brother Larry yeah. Dunham. Oh, Pioneer. Yeah. Yeah. Pioneer in technology yeah. and television yes. broadcast. He helped me produce uh, our film on, on Gus Hawkins. And, yes. Uh, indeed, while you were on the uh, topic of... Uh, peace and freedom is an objective of Martin Luther King's campaign and his work in civil rights. Um, Portland, uh, through the work of the Portland Business Luncheon, has recently hosted uh, Andrew Young, okay. Ambassador yeah. mm -hmm. Andrew Young, uh, former mayor of Atlanta, credited with bringing yes. the 1996 Olympics to Atlanta. And he said that, uh, and he's the last living soul to uh, have been on the balcony at the Lorraine Motel mm -hmm. uh, when Martin Luther King was assassinated. Yes. Yes. And uh, he said that uh, the only way to freedom uh, was that you have to overcome the love of money and you have to overcome the fear of death. Mm -hmm. He said, if you overcome the love of money, they can't buy you out. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. And yeah. if you overcome the fear of death, they can't scare you out. Well said. He was facing the Klan mm -hmm. uh, well yes. uh, face to face down there. And he said that that's what Martin Luther King gave him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. All right. Kenny. 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 Hey, well, Kenny. thank you for uh, allowing me to be a few minutes late. I uh, thought That's the right. program started a little bit later, and so I was out doing my you were thing. Well, actually, I started this morning at Port Haven playing Christmas music to the second shut-in, and that's how okay. I got started right. uh, yeah. this morning. But but nevertheless, I'm going to say a special thank you to Michael Chappie Grise and say a special thank you to you, Bruce Bazaar, thank and to Donnie, because you guys have put well, up with yeah, me all these years. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> my wife says I'm not the And we got more to do. We, we got get along with. But <laughs> nevertheless, after 30 years, you know, the model that we constantly use all the time is that we not only stand on the shoulders of those who have passed on before yeah. us, we are standing on the shoulders of those who are among us. So this is what we're trying to do mm. as an organization, is to pass this on. We didn't get here by accident. A lot a lot of people invest their time in mm. us, and uh, so we feel an obligation that we must give back. This is why part of the program this year, which we've uh, embraced uh, for the last uh, probably 10 or 15 years, is called the Lifetime Achievement Awards. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we're going to be doing this year is honoring Clara Peoples and also Geneva Knowles. Mm -hmm. Even though they've passed on, we're going to remind yes. everyone wow. that they still are living and among mm -hmm. us. We're also going to do another piece where we're going to continue on the, the legacy of Janice Scroggins and Linda wow. Harmbuckle, mm -hmm. because we want to make sure that Lou Frederick 
who is going to be coming, yes. who's going to give a little summary of what the state legislature did. Back yes. in March, mm -hmm. we went down to Salem, and basically the, the, the state legislature opened up the entire day, the beginning of the legislation process, by honoring Janice and Linda. So we're mm -hmm. going to do a little piece of that. Nice. Louis is going to present that. And Sharon Gary Smith is going to do an epilogue pulling all that together. We also are going to be acknowledging um, Mel Brown, uh, who has been around for a very long time, and Paul Knowles, who's going to be helping to MC a piece of that as well. Yeah. We're using video vignettes to kind of summarize as much mm -hmm. as we can, because we know that within a six-hour period, we can't get everything in right. there. We mm -hmm. tried to shorten the program, but yet and still, we're trying to do a better job of controlling the program. Mm -hmm. So we've done a lot of video, uh, thanks to Chris here at PCM, right. who's mm -hmm. been working with us, and, and you, like you said, Larry Dunham, we oh. can't forget him. If you notice on Facebook, that. I put a lot of pictures up there, not intentionally, deliberately, but I run through our four or five hard drives and yes. I find stuff wow, that I forgot man. we've even done. Mm -hmm. And Larry Dunham, I remember spending hours right yep. here at Portland Community Media, but before that it was called Rogers. Yes. We spent hours after the program yes. in 1985 yes. just doing what we editing. call post-production yes. editing, sometimes yes. 5, 10, 15 hours before we actually put in the air. But again, thanks to Portland Community Media, we, they're thankful that they're able to, to allow us to do this for live. Uh, it's going to be live streamed as well. It'll be tape delayed on Portland Public Schools or Television Services. It'll be on KBOO Live, starts at 11 o'clock on Monday, January 18th. We also have a national group coming down from from uh, Seattle, Washington. That's, that's uh, Grady Works and D Danielle Damon, who's going to help close out the program. Just going mm. backwards, just mm. giving a little sample. Mm. They're going to basically mm. turn it out. Wow. As Michael mentioned many times, when we first did this first program at New Hope Missionary Baptist Church, when we actually had uh, completed the program at Catlin Gable, helping to raise money for students for to go to 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 a, a school there, uh, minority students or students of color to go to Catlin Gable. The last part of the program we did at New Hope Missionary Baptist Church. As mm. Michael was outside, and I think Herb Cawthorn, he said, "You could see the walls just swelling." Well, this is what Dave, Danielle Damon and Great Works is going to do. Wow. Uh, when we close wow. the program. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Now, that's the end of the program. Coming back. We have schools, like Donnie said, we have community groups, we have Ronnie Wright and Love Speak, we have Derek McDuffie, we have uh, at least seven to eight different schools, dance groups, we have speakers, Loretta Smith, Jefferson, Smith, dancers. Jefferson yes. dancers, just to give you a little sample. Do you but, deliberately focus on the children? I notice the children are woven throughout that. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Even the young artists that are going to come with right. like, the professional group, as well as the, right. the right. children engaged. Why and a lot of the, the professional artists, like Elton T. Jones, oh, yes. come up oh, yeah. in our schools, mm -hmm. right. and they're mm -hmm. just some of the best <laughs> yes. artists in the right. world. Right. 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 You know, He's they were school kids, and, and uh, Janice Croggins and others right. mentored them and taught them. And, and, and speaking of mentoring, yeah. we're working on with, with Arietta, for example, yes. who's, who's coming along with us. We have mm -hmm. other people that are coming along with us that, mm -hmm. that we can hopefully be able to pass this thing on because Arietta reminds me that Mr. Barry, I was over your house when my mom was over there. Y'all started this many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. Janice Scroggins. Everybody yeah. knows that. So Her she's, mom is she's, Janice Scroggins. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And so what we're trying to do is make sure that we're passing this on. Mm -hmm. So we, our formula has been for the program eight minutes for performers, yeah. with the exception of a little the, the professional yeah, right, right, more, okay? right, right. and three minutes for the speakers just so that we can keep it flowing yes. and with the video yeah, right. vignettes that we're going to be having it's going to be even 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 tighter this year rosemary anderson for example we're going to be honoring uh for special lifetime achievement awards uh matthew barnett is going to be honored again as i said paul Knowles is going to be receiving a special acknowledgement from behalf of for um, honoring geneva Knowles. we also going to be honoring uh jim pettyjohn and last but not least heard us and Dorothy Hadley, who were the first African-American bakers in the state of mm -hmm. Oregon. And they're also listed in the Oregon Historical Society mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. so. Ken gives me the very difficult job of making sure that everybody that's speaking is just three minutes. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the artists and so forth, you have some... That's going to be tough. Now, you yes, some, but, the, but the good benefit of that is that all the speakers, whether they are from the community or whether they're from the mayor's office, yes, right. or what, they get their three minutes. They don't get more <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. because of their right. level of... Who's going to handle that guy? Yeah, that's where well, I got a hook. Yeah, got, we, got, we got Joe okay, B. Okay. Keller. Oh, yeah. Oh, we got Sand timers Man. out in front. Oh, you got Joe B. Oh, okay. Time okay. to stop, all that okay. stuff. Okay. Okay. Sandman. The sororities yeah. have yeah. often, the sororities have often provided us with timekeepers. We have these uh, big blue, red, and green yeah. you know, cards out front so that uh, the speaker can be reminded because yeah. actually people can get carried away just that's on it. the spirit of the day. That's wow. it. Let me just remind viewers that uh, may have just tuned in what we're talking about, and that's our 31st annual celebration of the life uh, and legacy of the Reverend Dr. 
Martin Luther King Jr. that'll yes. take place January 18th at Highland Christian Center, 7600 Northeast Gleason in Portland, Oregon. And everybody is welcome. Bring out a couple of cans of food in you in, babe. Yeah. We have a food drive and a small donation that we ask for. Uh, but this is all going to, to charity. This is totally a nonprofit Meeting, uh, yes. program yeah. that we that we have. And and uh, we have a lot of support from Portland Public Schools, Providence Health Services, uh, Portland Association of Teachers, Oregon Education Association, City of Portland, TriMet, and many more. It's important to note that we have a Victory Village Marketplace where many of the uh, folks in the community who have goods and services that they want to share with the general public will be mm -hmm. in that marketplace. And you can contact Sunshine Dixon. Or go online. Or go online. Wow. Uh, World, Arts World Arts Foundation. Dot org. Yep. That's worldartsfoundation.org, no caps, no breaks, and get more information about the village marketplace. That Victory Village has turned out to be uh, quite an, a bazaar, quite yes, an exchange really. for people to mm -hmm. have a voice who can't be on the program but have materials and things that would be worthy right. to be on the program. Again, has the difficult job of uh, actually sorting through who gets to be on a program. Mm -hmm. Even though the program is seven hours long, there still is a surplus of folk who for one reason or another, you know, don't fit into one of the themes that we have, or and we have to accommodate them. Uh, one of the benefits of having a, a green room, interview room, uh, and you've been in there as well, yeah. and seen that uh, we're able to capture um, off-camera remarks and comments by people who would otherwise we'd like to have as speakers, and this becomes a, an additional benefit along with our lifetime achievement nice. awards, nice. where these our elders are being honored and they are being. Uh, videotape or creating those vignettes, those then become part of our archive as mm -hmm. well. So not only is it efficient mm -hmm. from a production standpoint, mm -hmm. but it also adds to our library of, of great recordings mm -hmm. that we have already. From let, let, me, let me add something too in terms right. of, and that's why I really, really appreciate it today. Because when I first got involved, when you guys first, when you, when you guys were in, around here beforehand, mm -hmm. but when I got involved, mm -hmm. I, all of a sudden I, I got to a point, I said, well now, how would I, de I define what you guys are doing? And in all due respect, I think about Oregon Historical Society. You got me? And then when you think about Oregon Historical Society, it's a history, if you will, of Oregon. Exactly. Well, this is really a history of black folks. Exactly. Exactly. It's a history yeah. of black folks and in, 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 in a positive way. Mm -hmm. And too often you hear the negatives, if you will. You know, when you think about gang members, this, that, and the other, and police, and all this, that, and the other. But this gives you sort of a refresher update. Yes on what's happening in the, the real, what's happening in the community, not that 1% or 10%. Mm -hmm. And so I would, and that's, that's what I get out of it, and I'm hopefully folks will respond to that. And the other thing I would say is that you, you, you're in a church. Right. You're right. in Pastor right. Hardy's church. Right. Right. You know, We're thankful a, to Highland a, for this support very, as well. very, And that's, yeah. that's a beautiful yeah. piece right. because that is part of our history. Indeed. As, as a group. And, and so I, I wanted to make that point across. Yeah. It's really interesting you say that. that because I received a call the other day from a lady that was panicking. She says, I received this flyer here. <laughs> and I just want to know if I come, I'm going to be preached to. Yes. I said, well, you got to understand. First of all, <laughs> Am I know, be Martin Luther King to? was a minister. Yes, yes. And he preached about a thing called love. Mm -hmm. And love comes in all ways and different forms. No, you're not going to be preached to, but you're going to be given information yes. to hopefully get you to think yes. about what am I doing to contribute to, you know, this thing called peace. Yes. What am I doing to contribute to this thing called love? Because it's all about us working collectively and cooperatively together. This is why we say every meeting that we have, even yesterday, our team, we have a team of about close to 90 to 100 folks, okay? And we have an average of 45 people per meeting. And each time, like Michael said before, we used to aim at trying to satisfy who, Michael? The audience. Mm -hmm. And then we moved to what? satisfying the artist, thinking that if we could get the artist who, when they arrive, everything is in order for them. Their dressing rooms are aligned, the stage, the lights, the sounds, which is, makes a lot of difference Very if you can get that green, red carpet treatment for the audience and that if we took care of the audience, artist, they would take care of the audience and yes. we wouldn't have to focus on that. And, yes. we, and then we decided, well, you know, 
uh, the most important part of this are the people who are on our team right. around mm -hmm. the table, the communication team, the stage team, the, the food team. There's a lot of food that gets yes. uh, moved about on production day, and, and not to mention the production team, the security team, which we're thankful that we have uh, Sergeant Hollinsworth and uh, Jeff Brooks and uh, heading that so that we're able to have a, a real confidence of having the place secure, have the people feel secure, and have an un unobtrusive presence of, of law enforcement. So then we decided, let's focus on the team members. Let's make them happy. Let's let the people who have the communication committee and the people who have the marketing committee and the people who have the production committee, that their needs are met. And they, if they do their job, not only will the artists be taken care of, but the facility will be taken care of. The people who are volunteering will be taken care of. And so that's been the formula that has evolved. We didn't start out, it no. took us about 20 no. years to, <laughs> to get away from <laughs> trying to Learning please the audience, time. to try to please no. the artists, to pleasing the production team. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of my job that uh, we thankfully share, that we you know, have the health and strength and uh, this support of the, our elders in the community to, to uh, not make a big splash, but right, make right, something right. steady. Right. If you can imagine doing anything for 31 years, and it, it gives us an opportunity also to salute Bernie Foster and yep, the Scanner yep, Breakfast. This yep, is their yep. 30th year, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. so we. So we, this is why we adopt a model called uh, teamwork makes the yes, dream work. Dream work. Yes. So, and, Michael, and Michael's come up with this concept of don't forget stay in your lane. Yeah, yes. Because there's so many different lanes and components to this program. Again, we don't do it. It's not no one individual person. We don't claim you know our being able to do this individually we claim it collectively mm -hmm. and this is why we use our model teamwork makes the dream work i have to give credit to joe bean keller oh, who is our who is our Jobine. reluctant stage yeah. manager but <laughs> contributes he's a mighty he's like a tight end you know yeah, reliable yeah. You right, throw right, it, he's right. going to catch it you he know he's going to set it up <laughs> and make sure yes. uh, but he he was the one that ma made sure everybody stayed in their lane and <laughs> and then i just adopted it it seemed because it worked so well <laughs> Uh, I, I was in the company of, uh, I had the privilege to be in the company of Andrew Young, and he said that uh, a lot of things that people don't know about him, he was a track uh, athlete, and that at some university, he went for Howard University, so he don't know really how he graduated from Howard University, to hear him how humble he was about how he rose up. He said that he was getting into a track meet, and they told him, said, well, this is for, you know, they're running for the track championship here, and so you just... Uh, stay in your lane. In fact, you just stay out of the way. <laughs> and they put him in lane eight. <laughs> And Lane 8 is on the way outside. Right. He said he stayed out of their way all right. He never saw anybody after that <laughs> and set the track record from 21-7 to 21-4 wow. just by uh, staying out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes that's the best way. But. You know, guys, I want to spend a little time on the fact, I know your backgrounds very well, and a lot of times folks don't know who you are, so, but you're educators in your own right. You, you all, have always been involved with kids mm -hmm. and young people and young adults and whatever. And, and, I, and I, I think about that to say that that needs to be said, too. I'd like for you all to talk about that a little bit, because too often our kids, young people, are identified, i.e. gang members, you know, the, the negative side aspect of it. But as they go through, no one catches up with them at all. Is there, can you talk a little bit about how does, does the, the, this, this, week's theme, this year's theme, Victory Beyond the Dream, I'm thinking of beyond that well, dream. Well, we've been dreaming, thanks to Michael Chappie Gry, starting in 1978 with the concept of the World Arts Foundation Incorporated. Okay. We've been dreaming that, that long. Wow. And it's branched out from to many various different directions. We've been fortunate and blessed to, to work with uh, hundreds of people. Some have, are still with us. Some have gone on to greener pastures. But I think the main thing is what, what we've adopted in regards to our motto or our globe that we use. At the, what, what would you call it, Michael? Arts and education is our, our in, in intersecting that because one of the things we're concerned about is that arts are non-threatening mm -hmm. but it still conveys mm -hmm. purpose and meaning and understanding compassion so those are the things that we've tried to focus on over the years and I might also just mention too in, in connection with that we're going back to 1985 when first started this Maurice Wright who was director of the Jefferson High School Gospel Choir we've got him confirmed to come back to speak this year as well. Really? So when we talk about dreams, we're, we're trying to fulfill our dreams while we're alive, mm -hmm. rather than waiting until it's over. Yes. So it's just our, our giving back to what right. has been given to us over the years. In some ways, uh, it's uh, we've exceeded our dream. We didn't think that we'd 
when we started out that we got a 30 year program getting better each time and having being more refined no we just have been preserved and as we talk about solutions our specific uh, our particular way of phrasing it on our website and on our literature is working hard at the intersection of education and the arts. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. both that intersection of education and the arts, they've added arts to STEM now. They've finally, you know, come around to appreciating that we need the full circle to, to make ourselves human. But working hard, that's the work ethic that our parents and our elders have shown us. You know, the Paul Knowles of the world, that yeah. man is on the job every day. Yeah. You know, and that smile. And, and, and 85 smile. years old. Yeah, mm -hmm. the mayor celebration. of North Portland. But uh, we all agree that if we um, only describe our community in terms of the problems that we have, mm -hmm. we have a problem community. Mm -hmm. And this summer, we were able to uh, do a study of Alberta Street. Some people have seen the, the, the study and appreciate it. And that we found that there's a lot more opportunity than what meets the eye. Mm -hmm. And that if we use education and the arts as vehicles and strategies to help the young people see the opportunity, you know, uh, hope is in victory. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. When you, you're having, let's look beyond the dream. Mm -hmm. And uh, as my pastor, uh, Reverend Gordon in San Francisco say, don't wait till the battle's over. Start shouting right. now. <laughs> but you know, another thing that I want to throw on the table that a lot of folks don't realize is you, still, you guys are still in the education arena. Yes, sir. You know, you, you, you're out there teaching kids how to fly. Yes, sir. Black kids. Yes, sir. And Donnie, you're out there basically, when we were thinking about the guns and this, that, and the mm -hmm. other, you're out there not only just teaching family how to shoot, but just teaching the, the benefits and whatever about guns and whatever. And, and kids are teaching me 45 and, years worth. Yes, and you're, still, and, you're, <laughs> and, and you're still there. Yes, sir. You're in school now. Yes, sir. Right. right. I had a great experience uh, at Grant High School. And fortunately, the leadership that they have at Grant High School, Ms. Campbell, is exceptional. And now she's added to her team, uh, Diallo Lewis. But we had a, a leadership class going on there. And the kids showed me how access to the Internet, uh, gosh, Kevin Durant's victory speech, Oprah Winfrey's tribute to Maya Angelou, all of it is there. And so making use of those, this is what the kids have taught us. No wonder they're sometimes bored with school. We can't keep up with them. Mm -hmm. But as we do, um, and as we integrate culture mm -hmm. into the educational arena, then achievement is going to go up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gentleman in San Fran asked me, he said, say, Chappie, I see you made an Ebony magazine. I said, no, I didn't make Ebony magazine. He said, sure. He said, I got a copy in the car. You want to see it? And I said, well, okay. And so we started down the <laughs> hallway, and he said, he stopped. He said, Chappie, you ain't in no Ebony magazine. <laughs> but look how interested you were when you thought you were part of the curriculum. And now if you look at the artists that our kids listen to, if you look at the shows or the, the movies that they, if they're going to spend their hard-earned cash to go to the, the movies, what they do like. And it's not that they're uh, interested in discrimination or segregation or resegregation. They're interested in, like every other culture, in seeing themselves reflected. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. why... Nine out of ten guys want to be an athlete. They want to be a professional football player or a professional mm -hmm. baseball player. You can't blame them. And Ken, one thing I want to throw out to you, yeah. I want to give a kudos out to you, is that you really impressed me uh, through the, since I've gotten this so-called new machine. It's called mm -hmm. the, uh, either smartphone. Okay. <laughs> I mean, but, but the thing that got me about that is that you've given me the opportunity to see people, the activity of the community, right. and acknowledging senior citizens and contributions oh, to folks mm -hmm. and pushing family. Right, right. I mean, really talking right. about family, the interaction of family. Donna, you do the same thing, and you guys are still in the education the most. I want to thank, I want to thank you guys for doing that. Well, again, really we're, we're products of the education system. I had to go back to even Chappie years ago in 1974 when I wasn't sure I wanted to teach when I got out of school. I want to go back into broadcasting. But guess what? I made $130 after six weeks of working at a radio station. Yes. Mm -hmm. I said, wait a minute, this is not what I prepared mm -hmm. myself for. Mm -hmm. So fortunately, June Key and Michael Grice yes. hired me at Adams High School. I said, hmm, maybe I like this. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'll do this a couple, three years. Well, yes. here we go, 45 years later on, you know. We, and retired, no, we're uh, still, yeah, still yeah, teaching. Yes, we sir. had guys yes, like sir. Bob Gerber, who yes. uh, helped him with uh, his broadcast. Right. And between Bob Gerber and George Page, and uh, Kim was on fast track to become George a professional uh, speaker. <laughs> and I want to mention the, the Coalition of Black Men and their mentoring project, too, because they intersect with what we are doing. Mm -hmm. And if anybody, any organization really wants to have an impact in the short term, mentoring is a way to go. It can take a lot of different forms and you can control a lot of the variables and factors and mostly begins with leadership in the school. But uh, the Coalition of Black Men right now is learning. Uh, that this can really uh, make a difference. Well, guys, look here. I tell you what, we probably run out of time now, but I, I, want, I want to mention to the viewing audience that two weeks from today, you guys are going to be back on again. 
Okay. And hopefully then you can expand a little bit more on what we've we'll been doing. We'll bring some video for you. Please, do some video. Yeah, yeah we'll bring some stuff back. So two weeks from today. And I would also like to say, tell your friends, if you will, about this event. What day is this again? It's going to Monday. Be Monday, January 18th, 2016. Put it on your camera. What time does it start? Start 11 a.m. Runs mm -hmm. all day. And and it's going to be broadcast on cable radio and on PCM. And Donnie's voice is going to be right there. And, <laughs> cost, the and cost might be and just bring a couple of pieces of candy. We're, asking, or we're asking for $5 can, yeah, donation right, right. or can, five cans of food. Right, right. But no that's, one will be turned it's always mm -hmm. And it's a non Everybody's in. Right. Yeah. Nobody's out. That's right. what I'm saying. Right. That's right. That sounds great. Well, look, guys, thanks very much. Thank you. I'm looking forward to that, too. Okay. You know, I want to offer one thing for the people when we had the discussion earlier about the black church. Tomorrow morning, if you go to ncebc.org, you'll see how to get on the blog talk radio show and it's focused on the black church and the way it intersects with the arts and education sounds great i'm looking forward guys thank we're you. gonna thank have you. some fun okay. folks thank you. take care be there see you there then we'll take a short break and we'll be right back you are watching oregon voters digest this program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times Tell a friend. Welcome back, folks, to the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. Hey, look, we're at the end of the year now, and uh, we're just going to try to reflect, and we're trying to reflect back uh, what would be the most important area that we spent some time in that would be of benefit, if you will, to Oregonians, uh, specifically here in the Portland metropolitan area. And so I said, well, I asked myself that question, and I said, well, we talked about a lot of issues. We have. But the, but the idea is that uh, I brought the issue that I thought was... Uh, uh, as far as I was concerned, was the most important, and we still have a lot of work yet to do, and we're going to be doing something about it. And after you can see to, to my to my right, but to your left on the screen, I've got Don Dupay with me, former Portland police officer, and you know that's been basically, in fact, it's still on the major major scene at this point it in is, time. You know. It's still major. We're going to be talking about uh, law enforcement, police work, uh, whether you you actually doing the work or being a part of the work or whatever. But the fact of the matter is we got issues. It involves youth. It involves um, uh, the whole issue of weaponry and all this other good stuff. And, 
and uh, how it got there. But there's a lot of work to be done. If you want to get a better feel of, of some of the things that we talked about, you can go to the, the directory, if you will. We got a directory where you can go back to YouTube and pick up some of the older shows, and, and you will see basically Don and his, and his wife, Teresa. Don's written a book. Behind the Badge in River City. This is the one that I have in my hand. I've shown this to you before, but uh, but it's a it's a quite a book. Uh, it's an important police memoir from Don Dupre, uh, and uh, it's said with a forward by Phil Stamp and our dear friend Phil is also involved in whatever. But anyway, uh, I think that's what we're going to be dealing with. And and uh, Don just tells me that I want him to just kind of go back a little bit about uh, what he felt about being on the show and what he what he what he benefited from it, and it's kind of like where we're going and. And uh, just kind of just, we just have to give you this a little quick. So we just have a few mo few minutes and whatever. So why not, we, let's talk about this whole piece. Okay. Come on, Don. First off, well, introduce yourself with your book. I'm Don Dupree. Start with. I used to be a Portland police officer from 1961 to 1978. What happened there in that time is right here in this book. Right, right, right. All, right. The, all of the warts, all of the good things, and all of the bad things. Might add too that we're both veterans too, by the way. We are veterans. We're yes. both veterans. He was, was the Navy, in the, and he, the Navy, Navy, and I was the Marine Corps, and uh, and uh, they they were the Navy was a department of the Marine Corps, right? Is that the way it goes? That's what I hear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we right. gave you guys a ride. So. Yeah, that's right. I like that. I like that. I like that. Okay, good. Yeah. Well, that, just give them just a little brief, Don. And what did you learn? You, you you've written this book aspect of it. You've been here on um, Oregon Voters Digest aspect of it. You've sort of digested some of the deal, and after you we, we you you delved in involved and you got involved, if you will, with some of the history. You went yeah. to Oregon Historical Society. I know I know Teresa and, yeah. and I and you we went down there, and, and you guys did some things over there too. But with the whole issue of police, and you you checked out other other other, other issues as it relates to Portland police. Mm -hmm. And what have you learned? You think to date? Well, I've learned that the police are still a very closed society. Uh, very few, probably only one or two that I can think of, policemen have since said anything about the book or what I talk about. Uh, like I said once before on this show, the silence is deafening. Mm -hmm. So, we, but we continue to talk, talk about it because the Portland Police Department is very necessary in this city we're woefully short of police officers. We need to hire a lot more police officers. But what I find interesting, and we've talked about this before, is I did a five-year reorganization plan of the police department. Mm -hmm. And uh, I showed that to you, and I showed it to uh, Bruce Broussard, I mean, uh, Fred you're Stewart. Right. No, you're right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Fred Stewart yep. and, and yeah. others. Yeah, that is right. The thing about it is that uh, the police department, along with needing more officers, also needs a major reorganization. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like somebody slipped them a copy of my reorganization plan. Because, of late, right? Just because late. because they're we were doing, talking about this. Yeah. They're doing some of these things. Yeah, like what? Like like, specific. well, for specifically, uh, the, the Oregonian published an article about what the chief says that that they need more officers, of course, but they still need to reorganize. So what the police uh, officers uh, will be expecting to do is to change shifts. They're going to take officers from some of the specialty units. Mm. Uh, they're taking them from juveniles. They're going to be taking some from the gang unit. They'll be taking some, hopefully, from the motorcycle unit, which is more or less just a revenue-producing division and put these guys back on the street. So they're looking for ways to do what I said should be done. Yeah, we were talking about here on the show. Yeah, we were you've talking got about to, you've, got to, you've got to reorganize the police department and put people back on the street. There's too many, I hate to keep picking on the motorcycles, but there's 20, I've been told by the sergeant out of the motorcycle division in the traffic office mm -hmm. that there are 24 motorcycles. To me, that's two that's 12 two-man cars. 12 two-man cars. That's 12 two-man cars. They go back on the street and do police work. Uh, one of my favorite subjects also is internal affairs. Mm -hmm. Those are the guys that enforce the laws. That what do they do, enforced. internal affairs? Well, they whitewash what the police do when they get into trouble. Whitewash? That's okay. right. Mm. Bad word, whitewash. That's, mm -hmm. what, that's mm -hmm. what they do. What should do? What should, do? What what, should, what, what should do? we do? What, what should we do in regards to that okay. whole issue of investigating? Internal, internal affairs violates the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. Which is? The 14th Amendment says equal justice for all. It doesn't say 
that the police department can have their own judicial system, mm -hmm. or the plumbers, or the electricians, or anybody else. Right. Equal justice for all. Well, when you have an organization you call Internal Affairs, then Internal Affairs is listening to complaints against policemen. If they find that the policemen have done something wrong or broken the law or more than one law, they adjudicate a penalty. They Usually it's some time off, uh, off work suspended, maybe 30 days, which is a couple thousand dollars in my day. Mm -hmm. uh, so they find the person guilty, they find them $2,000, and then uh, they may or may not put them back in the same unit they were in. Is that what the 14th Amendment mm -hmm. says? No. It does not say you can do that. So, But has it progressed through the years? When you were on, and where are we today in regards to internal affairs? And internal then affairs for, what is, should we have? Internal affairs should ha has always existed. It always has existed. It's, it always existed. It hasn't changed other than... It hasn't changed any since I think it's gotten bigger. It's gotten bigger. Yeah. Uh, what I think should do, be done is, is internal affairs. Uh, if I was a chief of police, I would transfer them all somewhere else. If there's ten guys, that's two. That's that's more two man car on the street. So you take some from motorcycles, you put them on the street. You take some from internal affairs, you put them on the street. You take some from juveniles, you put them back on the street. But you will still have the department. Still have the department, okay. but that doesn't mean that nobody's going to get a traffic ticket anymore mm -hmm. because there's no motorcycle right. cops out there. Everybody's a policeman, and just like it, it was when I worked in. Uh, the Prowl Division, whose job is not necessarily traffic, you write traffic violations when you see them. So you still write traffic tickets when you see violations. I don't know about you, but it was, when I'm driving around town, I see people running red lights, mm -hmm. uh, not stopping for stop signs. Mm -hmm. uh, the bicycles are the worst. Mm -hmm. You know, if if you want more revenue, <laughs> if mm -hmm. you want more revenue, have a sting on the bicycles. Mm -hmm. Every bicycle. It goes through a red light, gets a ticket. Lots of money coming in. Mm -hmm. So, so there's an untapped source of revenue. But, mm -hmm. but, in in the long run, if you get rid of internal affairs, then the question is, how do you have a police discipline? Mm -hmm. Police discipline needs to be done in open, and not behind closed doors, and they need to. Uh, be responsible to the people that they pay their wages as citizens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The only way that I can see that that will be done is if I, I'm the mayor or the chief once a week, if necessary, or more often if necessary, the offending officer uh, goes before the city council, private. Uh, he sits over there with his lawyer should he choose to bring one. But the entire city council acts as an advisory. Mm. The chief of police sits there and he makes the ultimate decision and then uh, the district attorney has a chair and he's there because if the officer has committed a broken the law, then it's the district attorney, of course, that's going to have to um, prosecute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the city council can make a recommendation, the district attorney can make a, can make a, a determination whether the guy needs to be arrested and, and tried or not. And he has his attorney there at all times. He may speak or he may not speak. Well, but at the same time, under today's criteria, the way it's run today, mm -hmm. uh, there's a threat, if you will, of, uh, of, of, of basically saying, uh, we're going to strike. We're going to strike. We're not going to do police work. I, I mean, how do you deal with that? Well, they piece? can't strike because that's against the law. But they do. Well, they say, uh, I, I, I'm just not going to do as much work. You know? Okay, well, I'm not going to do as much work. Then you're not going to get as much pay. Right. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh -huh. So that that's really internal management. If I'm the, if I'm the supervisor at North Precinct and I think you're not doing your job mm -hmm. and you're getting paid to do the job, then I'm going to take sanctions of mm -hmm. some kind. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always that you sometimes just need to shake things up, Bruce. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you just need to shake things up. Well, you know, I, I appreciate what you're saying because, as you know, I sort of, I sort of taken that bull by the horn too, mm -hmm. and uh, we had been talking about the possibility of getting involved with, um, with our, pre our so-called president administration, our elected officials yeah. and the like, i.e., with the city of Portland. I'd been talking about maybe in reference to talking about being the mayor 
I mean, the mayor, it's so easy to talk about it because in all due respect, that's the CEO. I mean, that's the, sure. that's the CEO or that's the commanding officer uh, of, the, of the police department. And the idea is that, you know, we talked about you being the, the liaison because that's what you've been. You've been a Portland policeman. Yes. I haven't. And the whole idea is that you'd basically uh, be the contact person and whatever and set some of the guidelines. But again, with the public's approval, that's very, very important aspect of it. And, um, and again, like I said, that's why I'm doing this right now, because it's the end of the year. We do plan to get in, more involved in this issue. There is an upcoming election, if you will, for mm -hmm. both the mayor and two of the city council people. And I do know how to count. But the idea was that um, uh, maybe possibly running for mayor. And the only rationale is that I have for that is that there might be an opportunity to, to bring this issue on the table yes. uh, and talk about this while, while, as we, while we've gone through this whole political situation aspect of it. And actually, to date, I'm a little concerned. Actually, it's always like anything else. I'm a little concerned about who's running for office because the person has to have a similar kind of a background. Mm -hmm. Well, in your particular case, you were police. My particular case, I'm, I'm a former Vietnam vet, Marine Corps type, small business person, family man, the whole nine years, and, and I'm a senior citizen. I'm very familiar with what's going on. I got a little background, just like yourself. Yes. You got background. And so the whole idea is that um, we're thinking about the possibility, I'm about 85% sure, to run for office, to run for office, naturally wanting to run to win, but the whole idea, I want to make sure it gets on the table. Because if you're outside talking to this issue, like we are here at, at Cable, talking about it, but to a certain degree, the, the, the normal press will not take this media and really do an investigative deal and really blah, blah, blah. But if you're running for office, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, you have to be listened to. Mm -hmm. At least you get the forum out there. Is exactly. that fair? You that's got right. me? Yeah. So, so, I, so that, that's one of the points I think we want to make um, in 2016. We want to continue the conversation that we have. Mm -hmm. You're going to be part of the conversation. I'll be part of the conversation. But again, we'll be in a kind of a something that's acceptable, and that is uh, the, the ideas, if you will, uh, the, if you will, are, uh, are the issues uh, are running for office. Yes. Is that fair? <clears throat> it is fair. So one of the things that we need to address is what the people complain about constantly. What is that? No matter what the police do, nothing ever happens. Nothing ever happens. Nothing ever happens to them. Did that, that happen during your day? Yes. But what happened? Well, why, why, yes. didn't, why, yeah. why didn't? Why did? Did someone respond to that? Why didn't they? Res did, didn't they Internal respond? Internal affairs always always takes it and, and shuffles it off. Yeah, but we have a police review board now. That was supposed to be a part of it. We got a police review board, and the whole idea is that, and isn't the term, uh, internal affairs, uh, don't they have, aren't they members of that organization, that board? No. That's the city of Portland, folks. I want to let you know. The police, the police, review, police board. review board just whitewashes what the police do. They have no teeth. What do you mean? They whitewash the same thing? They whitewash what the police do wrong. Why is that so? Because they're afraid of the police. Interesting. Because they're afraid. The only way to put a stop to it is to, is to put teeth in it, is to make them the police officers responsible to the citizens. I don't see any other way to make them responsible except in, in eliminating internal affairs and stop violating the 14th Amendment. Well, how do you get the police to come to the table? You know, from the standpoint that they are part of, part and parcel, not only as individuals trying to benefit, if you will, or, uh, if you will, but they're, they're working. Everybody's working, right? Everybody got to eat. I understand they're employees. that. They're employees, right? They're employees. But 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 under the circumstances, that the situation that you're talking about, you're not defining them as, as uh, employees, but actually <laughs> but as employers. Are. They are employees, and if an employee messes up, his boss is going to fire him, or his boss is going to sanction him. The problem is that 85 percent of the Complaints against police are f never found valid. That's that is just mathematically that's a white war. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so well, how do you change that? Though I mean, you still got that entity that's there. I mean, in person, you know. No, you don't. You don't have that entity. You don't have that entity. You don't have internal affairs. It doesn't exist. So this won't exist in this, this it new. Won't, it won't exist. So what do in we my do? So what do we do? Uh, you're saying that we dot the eyes and cross the t's as far as um, uh, their their. Let me see. What, what am I calling it? Their their duties or their uh, the criteria or their training volumes or whatever. You know what I'm saying? You have to make the police what about understand. about the rules and the regs? You have to make the mayor understand. Okay. That you can't enforce illegal things. Violating the 14th Amendment is illegal. And frankly, I'm surprised that at some time or another, some federal judge 
hasn't prosecuted one of these internal affairs people for, for running a private judicial system. Hmm. To me, that's a very real possibility. Are you saying that everybody's scared all above the line? They're all scared above the line. And the, and the definition of scared is if to say, are well, they going to investigate them or go through the books or whatever? Everybody's equal under the system because the police have a job that's unique like no other job. Only the state can kill a person by sanction. But they give that same power to a policeman. Wait a minute, say that one more time. Only the state can kill a human being okay. legally okay. by putting them to death. That's, that's, that's what they do. Okay. They, but they give that same power to a police officer. You have the right, you have a life or death situation. You're, you're going to be the judge and the jury and sometimes the executioner. Are they trained that way? Yes. They are trained. In training. They're trained properly, except they don't have the right equipment sometimes. But, but, uh, but you know, you still need law enforcement, you, and you, you got to have bodies, if you will, to do that. Yeah. And uh, you know, so how do you? That's a tough one. So where do you start? You, I'm not saying it's not tough, Bruce. It's, I mean, it's tough to get that. I mean, we've been doing this stuff for so long. Well, we. That's right. We've been breaking the law for so long. We think it's okay. So it's really the public's responsibility. It's the public's responsibility. They're at fault, too. It's not yes. just a one-sided but, deal. But, but there's not like they're not complaining about it because the citizens are constantly complaining, well, that cop shot the guy or he did this or that, and he never did, nothing happened. He got a two-week vacation. And that's what has to stop because the citizens need to have the idea that, gee, you're no different than me except you do a different job than me. Mm -hmm. But if you screw up, you pay the same penalty as I do. Mm -hmm. You go before mm -hmm. the same circuit mm -hmm. court judge as I do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can I can use this, I can use this example because it has irritated me for forty years. Mm -hmm. uh, I was working traffic as a young cop. Uh, a, a car runs a red light in front of me. I go, wow, you run a red light, so I pull in behind him, turn on my red light. He speeds up, turns off his lights speeds up, he's going 90 miles an hour in a 35 zone, and I'm right behind him. He runs a red light at Holgate and Milwaukee at 95. In Portland. In Portland. Uh, wow. And then he zigzags around and trying to, he's trying to get down to uh, McLaughlin Boulevard so mm -hmm. he can really go. But he turns a laugh and he gets involved and he gets stuck in a dead end street. He slams to a stop. I pull my police car behind him open my door, jump out, open his door, drag him out, he's mm -hmm. drunk. It's Detective Sergeant George Hempy of the Portland Police Department. It was deceased now, I believe. Mm -hmm. I was so mad. So I couldn't arrest him. He was you couldn't? Another, I couldn't arrest him. Why is that? Because he was another policeman. My sergeant shows up, good guy, takes him home, has he has his car taken care of? Uh, Sergeant Hempy went before Internal Affairs. They found him guilty of break of the crime. If I had uh, charged him, I might have charged him with a, a, a reckless driving for sure, looting a police officer for sure, and uh, that's a felony now, mm -hmm. looting a police officer. Mm -hmm. So he would have had to go to court. He'd have got a big fine. He'd have lost his driver's license. He'd have lost his uh, uh, job. And then, if it had been at the circuit, if it had been a regular court, that's what would have happened to him. What Internal Affairs did was they found him guilty of eluding a policeman and being drunk, and they suspended him for one month, which cost him in those days a couple of grand. And since he was a detective sergeant, they reduced him, and they didn't reduce him in rank. He kept his sergeant stripes, but they put him uh, uh, back in the uniform as a patrol sergeant. So is that, that's a flagrant violation of the 14th Amendment. And that's what the police have been doing for so many years they think it's right. And that's what the citizens are continually complaining about. Well, what happened to him? He's still a cop, he's still a sergeant. Should never happen. But boy, I tell you, that's going to be a uh, that's going to be something, tough. It's going, going to be, be a tough, tough. situation because you know, like I said, um, if a person just getting on a force aspect of it, then they get basically called in so, and say, "Here, the here's the name of the game." Yeah. You know, I mean, this is your contract with the city or the public. The contract the, is illegal. The contract is illegal. You can't have a contract that violates the law, and that's what the peace union contract does. Mm -hmm. It violates the Fourth Amendment. Mm -hmm. You can't do that.
Well, most of them don't want to talk about it. Of course they don't. They don't want to talk about Nobody it. Nobody wants to talk about it. That's Power is tough. You know, there's the old, yeah. as women say, they've always said that who, there's gun control. He who has the gun rule, right? That's right. right. That's the, 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 That's right. What's the golden rule? Yeah. He who has the gold rule and yeah. on, on the, on the public his. side, right? Yeah. In terms yeah. of people who represent. And then on the other side is that who has the gun rule. Yeah. But now everybody has guns. I think so that how are we going to deal with that? Well, but everybody has guns. Okay, I, everybody and, and now, has they, now they feel threatened, if you will, about getting shot now. By who? The police, by, by the public. Okay, well, but they can't shoot back. Who's that? The citizens, they can't shoot well, they back. Well, they're shooting back they now. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, it's a problem, yeah. right? Yeah. It, it is a problem. Yeah, it's a problem. The ultimate solution, other than just, if you're the chief of police, you just transfer everybody to uniform. Just so, there, okay. so there is okay. no more. Okay. So there is okay. no more okay. internal affairs. So we got to spend some time on the public side too. We do. You know, what I mean, we're going to ask the public how they want it handled. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, uh, we just can't go around and just say, okay, fine, we're going to take this whole history aspect of it, and all of a sudden we won't even have a force if all of a sudden you go back and and people start thinking, well, he did it, and he did it, and I didn't do it, he did it, et cetera. So you can't do it that happen. way. You can't do that. You got I don't to. Think that'll happen. You got to kind of give a little immunity or something or something. And I, think, say, I think. I think. of some sort or whatever. I think. Exactly. Well, I think that like those eventually words? they will get used to it. The system will work. The yeah, system will I think, work. I think because it would have public support. Okay. Well, uh, well, as you can see, folks, we there's a lot to talk we about. We got a lot to talk and about, and and in all due respect, but, even, but if you want to change it, if you want if you want the police department back in the citizens' control, you got to do some really tough okay, things. Okay. That's a, that's, a, that's kind of a tough thing for you out there right now publicly. You've written a book and you're talking yeah, about this yeah. stuff publicly aspect of it, and I and I think it's sincere and I, and I think it's something that uh, really needs to be discussed, especially now in the wake of everything. Yeah. I mean, we got folks coming from outside that are, and we're we're in need of that support yeah. of law enforcement. We need it. We got all this yeah. stuff, ISIS and all that other good stuff that's running around here. We need some help. Okay. The federal government has been looking closely at the police department because of these violations. Yeah, but like I said, we still got all this other stuff, so we got to get this force back in place, yep. if you will, so that they can protect the citizens as we see them. Yep. Well, in all due respect, folks, that's why uh, I'm running for mayor, and hopefully in the primary, uh, that's what we're going to do. We're going to be our whole purpose is to put it on the table and make sure that the folks who are running for office respond to some of the issues that we're talking to right now. It's a very important. And if we're not right, guess what? We're out of it, right? That's right. But the whole idea is to get it on the planet platform and have these people talk about these issues. Very, very important piece. So you get a feel for that. And then naturally, when you think about police, that is the biggest thing going. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden we got our youth, we got we got uh, we got education. There are a number of issues, but the fact of the matter is we got to start somewhere. So police is a big hit aspect mm -hmm. of it. And I think the way I'm going to be doing is that right now in the city of Portland, you don't even know who your commissioner is. <laughs> you don't even know who your commissioner is. These guys, yeah, just, yeah. these people, just sit back and they just enjoy themselves. And then the mayor tends to be the only person that's there to represent the folks. Mm -hmm. But in all due respect, one of the things I plan to do is that I plan to look at the possibility of districtizing the city of Portland. Mm -hmm. See, therefore, you'll know who your commissioner is. Okay. So anyway, you'll be hearing a, you'll be hearing more about this, but we're going to focus on that piece, and that's why we're going to get involved. And you're going to be right there with me yeah. as we're debating these issues, if you will, for the city of Portland. So hopefully, it'll be some benefit. So, folks, we spent some time. You have some ideas of what we get ready to do, and I would suggest very strongly get out there and vote. This is going to be a very important election this yeah. time around. Very, very important election. So at least get pre prepare yourself and 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 register to vote and get involved with the issues and whatever, and tell them to tune in on the Oregon Voter Digest. Tell your buddies, tell your friends. And we're also going to have a candidate's fair here at, uh, at Portland Community Medium. We are going to do that, okay, for the city of Portland and all the folks who are running. So thank you very much for being with us. We appreciate you being with us. We'll see you not, not next week, but the following week, okay? Take care. Have a good evening. And Merry Christmas to everybody. Merry Christmas, everybody. And Happy New Year's.